Thank you, Charlie. And uh, thanks, uh, everyone at uh, SSF for sure and uh, Swedish for allowing me to participate in this course. Uh, I've participated in many courses here. They're all amazing, uh, usually virtually. This is my first trip here, and this is an amazing facility. I also want to give a shout out to Wyatt Ramey and Mauricio Avila, who were uh, fellows here last year and three years ago with the group, and they uh, got amazing training. Uh, it's uh, not uh, uh, unbeknownst to me about sharing the faculty stage with this amazing faculty and uh, being in between uh, Dr. Hartle and Dr. Pimenta and Dr. Uribe and everyone here is just amazing. So I want to share with you a little bit of a different topic. Uh, you're learning a lot of techniques here this weekend. I'm going to share with you a little bit higher level topic about maybe robotics, enabling technologies, how you can distinguish yourself in your early part of your career as you're transitioning into your career um, out of residency and fellowship and training. And also to uh, share that you, know, you can teach an old dog like me new tricks, uh, even if we can't teach Dr. Chapman all of the new tricks. How many of you in your programs use image guidance and navigation for spine routinely? <laughs> How many of you use it occasionally? Okay. How many of you have any exposure to robotics at all in the spine? Okay, perfect. So this is, this is a great group. So we're going to highlight some of these things. Uh, I am a consultant for Medtronic. I do invite anyone to come down to Tucson to, to see some of our um, navigated robotic uh, outpatient minimally invasive surgeries. Happy to host you all. So going to really talk about uh, briefly MIS and navigation, but mostly about robotics. And I want to use that technology to, to trigger your appetite for how you can distinguish yourself in your early career. And what I've been able to do recently is distinguish myself and my community in a very competitive environment with minimally invasive outpatient lumbar fusions at the hospital. And I'll share with you some of those cases. And again, I want you to, obviously you're in your learning and training, but I want you to use this as a stepping stone for lifelong learning. And some of these things that you'll see in red are sort of how I highlight my lifelong learning. So I'm old school neurosurgeon, open spine surgeon from the 90s, maybe even before some of you were born. Uh, and uh, lumbar discectomy and laminectomy was, every case was the same, whether it was 5145, it was the exact same surgery. Uh, that's typically how we treated patients back in the 90s during my training. The most enabling technology at that time was a microscope. Uh, everyone stayed in the hospital for a lumbar disc. Uh, if you had a dural leak, you didn't get out of bed for 48 hours. Um, so we've come a long way. In my training for lumbar fusion, everything was open, everything was posterior lateral. Inner body fusion was new. It was new. <laughs> I want to emphasize that. The cage range of ALIF was very, very new. Patients were in the hospital on average five to seven days, PCA pumps, didn't get out of bed for a day or two, and that was routine and that was normal. We also worked collaborative with orthopedic spine surgery. I probably put in less than 20 pedicle screws in my entire residency until I finished in 1998. So most, most of what we're talking about, us, us old guys and gray hairs and no hairs, are things that we had to learn out of training. So I use that as an emphasis. Don't Please don't think that you finished your residency and your fellowship, and you are good to go, right? If you're not learning new things every five to 10 years and applying it to your practice, there's something wrong with you, not your teachers. All right, so goals of surgery, obviously improve pain and neurological function. As an old school neurosurgeon, that were, those were the only goals. All the stuff in yellow was stuff that has evolved over time, and I think it's certainly important to think of those things in your patient outcomes, not just improving pain and improving neurological function. Same thing with surgeries and risks and complications, right? We certainly want to reduce those risks and complications, but we really think about other things now, reducing adjacent segment disease. How can we do the best operation first and hopefully the last operation, even though we know that in a small percentage of patients, we're going to have to do further surgeries. So this led to a lot of opportunities over my career, and that's looking at different ways to improve our techniques, a lot of different ways to improve implants. There's a whole room of people out there that are going to tell you about their implants and bone grafting. But certainly probably the rapid rise in enabling technologies over the last 20 years is where I think we've seen the most significant advancements. And we've already talked a lot about, or briefly talked about those, and you'll see more of those in the lab today and tomorrow. 
And so I started picking up minimally invasive surgery back in 2003. Um, and recall that this is really a surgical philosophy. It's not about an incision size or where your incision is. It's not specifically about a retractor or a biologic or a special cage or a perk instrumentation. It's a philosophy. And if you can adapt that philosophy or start to adapt that philosophy, you realize that we can apply MIS techniques and philosophy to every operation we do, including some of the big wax that we're seeing in the cadaver lab today and tomorrow. So whether it's an anterior fusion to a lateral to an extra foraminal, uh, we can apply that philosophy. And I encourage you, if you haven't had much experience with that, start thinking about it. And I think you'll find uh, ways to add that into your armamentarium. Well, in general, we know that there's a lot of publications about the scientific evidence of improvement in outcomes with MIS. Uh, this is a friend of mine down here who's a former F-14 pilot who had a lumbar discectomy in the 1980s. And look at the degree of atrophy and scar tissue in his paraspinal muscles. Uh, from a lumbar discectomy, traditional open technique. And now we can apply these technologies and techniques and, and get rapid benefits, uh, even as much, if not more so, than our current open techniques. Navigation, uh, again, I think it was only half of the room here kind of uses navigation on a routine basis. I encourage you to think about navigation for a lot of reasons. It not only improves your accuracy of screws, uh, it's better for you. Uh, there's less radiation to you. I would argue that ergonomically it's better for you. You're starting your very young spine surgical careers. You're gonna do thousands of cases in your career wearing lead. Right? That sucks. Uh, my dad is a retired interventional radiologist, and when he retired and I was at the peak of my uh, career, every six months he would call me and say, hey, remember my partner, Dr. Smith? He's got multiple myeloma in his sternum. Uh, he's got a squamous cell carcinoma of the apex, and he's not a smoker. So I encourage you to take some time and look at the literature on radiation exposure in spine surgeons. And there's a significant increase in interventional cardiologists in cataracts, thyroid, and malignancies. And right now, you guys are just focusing on, you know, chunking out cases and going, uh, you know, balls to the wall. But think about your own health, and we heard that earlier already from Mr. Becker. So certain surgical navigation does improve our accuracy. We should be probably in the greater than 90% success rate at placing uh, pedicle screws or instrumentation no matter what navigation system you use. And we've already seen some examples of the dreaded misplaced screw. And we know that a misplaced screw can cause a neurological deficit. It can also cause a CSF leak. It can also cause, uh, cause us to do a reoperation. We all hate reoperations as a complication, but how much does it cost, right? I think you all as young surgeons need to start to consider costs and resource utilization as part of your practice and your decision making. And so there's a lot of literature, but the average is around twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to revise anyone in the spine. How about a post-operative wound infection? In the spine, there's a lot of evidence that shows the average additional resources and costs for a post-op wound infection is thirty-five dollars to $50,000, all right, to reoperate, wash it out, take out instrumentation, put in new instrumentation, pick line, six weeks of IV antibiotics. That's become routine for us for the practice of medicine, which is fine, but the practice of medicine in the future is going to be you are going to have to make some of these decisions based on cost. So we want to try to lower our risk of complications so that we can not eat up all of our resources. And as my parents used to say, there's not going to be enough money in Medicare to take care of you, Rick, right? So I'm, mess I'm passing that message on to you. There may not be enough uh, money left in Medicare when you guys need it for insurance. Uh, so think about that again early in your career. Well, how about robotics? I, we adopted this at uh, two different centers, both in the private practice community hospital world and then in, uh, at the University of Arizona about a year and a half ago. So what are the benefits of robotics? It's not, it's not just a drill guide. I know everyone says it is. It's advanced software planning, not only for screws, but cages, the rods, your skin incisions if you do MIS. Dr. Hartle and I love that uh, idea of using robotics and image guidance for uh, MIS cases. Deformity correction. And, and ultimately, we'll have tools to be able to, us to use the robot to do the actual decompression and the fusion part of the operation. And again, because most of these are navigation-based or have navigation infolded into the system, it continues to improve our accuracy. There are now several published reports where the accuracy of pedicle screws with navigation 
automation-based robots or robotics is now 98, 99, and even 100%, even in large series of thousands of screws. So this particular system has three components, the predictability of planning, the precision of the robot, and the visibility of navigation. And I think when you combine all of those, you can see that we all love to work with fancy toys and widgets. And this is probably in the you know, 2023, uh, the highest technology available for us in spine surgery. In order to do that, we rely on this amazing computer software that was designed by some 13-year-old probably in East Asia. Uh, but this uh, particular robot is super slick with its planning and construct design, its ability to do segmentation for its registration. So you can have anatomy that in the supine position is one way, and in the operating room they're prone in another way, and it will still successfully register the spine to accurately do the decompression and fusion. Uh, this particular robot has advanced technology that gets added about every year or two. Our uh, latest upgrade is coming up in a couple of weeks. We're very excited about it. And that will allow us to integrate patient-specific pelvic deformity data measurements into the plan of placing screws and placing sagittally balanced rods to achieve the best correction. It is also going to allow us to now use a tool to do facet decortication and then a, a, a posterior lateral fusion in addition to the inner body, uh, something that may be important in certain cases, uh, but maybe not necessarily in all cases. So at some point in time, you'll jump on the bandwagon for the new technology. Who in here has an Apple uh, iPhone 14? All right. Those are the guys who always want to have the newest one. How many have 13s and 12s? Yeah, how many of you have something earlier than an iPhone 8? Oh, I love it. I had my iPhone 6 forever, and then I finally, because we had to get the group plan with three daughters who wanted the 12s, and my wife who wanted the 14. So anyway, the idea is ultimately you're going to jump on the bandwagon with your technology, right? And you have to decide when it's appropriate for you in your practice. Again, we have this very, very robust software to specifically design every screw placement. So now it's not just about walking in doing 7545 screws for everything. Thing. You can individually plan each pedicle screw for the anatomy. And if you particularly like MIS where, where I do, I may not touch the facet and lamina on the contralateral side, but that can affect my screw trajectory and screw size, right? I'm not doing an open where every screw is the same. So this software helps me sort of individually plan every pedicle screw. And with that, the software can start to plan inner body placement, cages, look at individual local segment or single segment lordosis. And even for an old guy, general neurosurgeon, spine surgeon, doing one level T lifts for lumbar degen, I still want to provide my patient with the best outcome. Decompression, stabilization, arthrodesis, improving the local lordosis, and hopefully reducing adjacent level problems. And now that I'm at a level one trauma center, we've got tons of trauma coming in, and we've certainly learned how to adapt these techniques for trauma where we might be able to do multi-level percutaneous stabilization without doing a correction, without doing a fusion, and still get a good result with those patients and get them mobilized as quickly as possible. These simple type of techniques with the software then allow us to do the more complex planning. So whether it's a multi-level MIS where we're actually using the software to plan the skin incision, I found myself, uh, you know, sort of, what? I really need a software to plan my skin incision? But you do. If you're doing multi-level skin incisions and stabs and you want all the pedicle screws to line up properly and you want the easiest part of the operation to drop the rod instead of the hardest part of the operation, it really requires or can be helpful to use incision planning with computer software. So a couple of different workflows for this robot, either CT to fluoro, which is getting a pre-op CT prior to the patient going to the operating room, and then registering with two fluoro shots in the operating room. Or if you have O-arm technology, you can use the O-arm scan and plan technology to do all of that registration uh, planning uh, in the operating room. And with that, robotics can be applied to anything. It can be applied anything from a pure MIS technique all the way up to percutaneous, all the way up to opens. It can be for deformity, degenerative, pediatrics, adult. You can apply robotics and navigation virtually to any surgical approach, lateral, 
uh, oblique lateral, prone trans-OS, prone lateral, single position. And so the idea is it's a technology that you can find useful, hopefully in your practice, uh, for the best outcomes. Uh, we have this debate, how many of you are trained to put in all your instrumentation first? Raise your hands. Higher, 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 higher. How many of you are trained to put in your instrumentation last? I knew it, I'm always, <laughs> Dr. Pimenta and I. It's kind of old school spine surgery. We would do the decompression first, do the inner body, and we'd put the screws in last. And the reason was we always thought decompression is the most important part of the operation, do that first. Secondly, uh, we didn't have some of the fancy widgets like navigation robotics to accurately put in screws at the end. But my argument for that is essentially the flexibility of robotics will allow an old guy like me to still put in my instrumentation last uh, or to adapt to all of you young people who do all of your instrumentation first. So what has this allowed us to do? Well, we started to creep into COVID, and uh, I found an opportunity to use the technologies to advance the operation I'm doing, get great outcomes, and provide outpatient lumbar surgery for my patients. Started that at the end of 2019, and then because of COVID, uh, some of you may not have gone through this, but most of us did, where we had significant challenges in doing inpatient elective surgeries. I uh, couldn't do it at all. Uh, I had patients who were clamoring to get their operations done and told me, I don't care, do the operation and I'll go home. I'll figure out the pain control at home. So we did selected patients during COVID for outpatient lumbar fusion at the hospital, taking away the ASC to issues that we talked about and found some early success. So now I looked back and say, okay, well, how can I convince myself and my patients that this is a, a, a successful operation and could be done with reasonable safety and reducing complications? So if you add things like MIS philosophy, surgical navigation for accuracy, robotics for enhanced accuracy, and extended recovery ERAS protocols or medication protocols, as well as patient education, you can see how you can potentially do something like this. So in Tucson, 90% of the lumbar fusions I've done in the last year and a half, two years, two and a half years, uh, are done as an outpatient. Patients go home within three to four hours. Uh, since we started doing robotics, we are nearly 50% of all of our lumbar fusions are done as an outpatient. Again, not an ASC. And you can see the age range is pretty typical for one and two level degen spondies and spinal stenosis all the way up to an 84 year old who had a two level T lift and went home the same day. Most of the same indications, same types of surgeries, whether it's T lift, PLIF, lateral fusions, uh, most are one level, occasional two and three levels. And these types of newer technologies do not have to add a lot of OR time once you get through your learning curve. So probably after about 20 cases with robotics, our time is at net zero from where I used to do an MIS navigated uh, operation without robotics. So we've only had two patients who had to be uh, kept in the hospital because of pain. They still went home the following morning, which many of you may not know, but that can still be considered an outpatient in a bed, right? So from payer status and things, it's still an outpatient operation. So let me just fly through a couple of cases just to whet your appetite on doing MIS robotic navigated fusions as an outpatient. So real common operation for me, 84-year-old, uh, has some mobile spondy at 4-5 had a recent hemilaminectomy open for a synovial cyst, did well, had the cyst recurrence, that's what our MRI scan looks like. The, the surgeon did a great operation. You can barely see any laminotomy there, but probably because she had some underlying instability. So here's her two-level plan for robotically placed instrumented fusion with expandable cages and a T-lift. And this is the lady who was just done about six weeks ago and was able to go home a couple of hours after surgery. Here is my wife's ex-cousin <laughs> who uh, traveled from Dallas to uh, her cousin, well, whatever. Uh, so grade two spondy, bad stenosis, uh, foot drop. <laughs> uh, and uh, so she came out to Tucson and we did an MIS technique sort of bilateral tubular retractors. So I call it a PLIF. It's probably more technically a bilateral T-lift. 
You can see how we jacked her up, we got her reduced, uh, put in a couple of static cages, and with, in, uh, with robotics, we can plan these screws. You can see on her pre-op CT where she's got complete disc space collapse, and now she's completely reduced, jacked up in an MIS technique, and she uh, went home to the hotel. Uh, I did not offer her to stay at my house because she was the ex-cousin, and uh, she was able to fly home <laughs> to Dallas about two days later, and she's doing great. Here's a lady who I did an MIS lumbar decompression at L45. She's a retired nurse, and her husband is an anesthesiologist. Um, she had a great result, but she ends up developing sort of chronic back pain, uh, recurrent radicular pain. You can see she's collapsing her disc space. She's starting to get a lateral asthesis. So I offered her a lumbar instrumented fusion with robotics, and we were able to do this as a single position oblique lateral inner body fusion, and a lateral position used the robot and navigation to place very, very safely percutaneous pedicle screws, and she went home a couple of hours later. Uh, so non-degenerative elective stuff, here's a trauma patient, a head-on collision, and multiple orthopedic injuries requiring surgery, normal neuro neurological examination, kind of a gnarly looking fracture, um, but we were able to do this uh, with uh, MIS technique and robotics, pure percutaneous stabilization. He reduces on the table. Uh, we did sort of a three above, instrumented the fracture level and two below, and this is an hour and a half operation, essentially percutaneous and we can mobilize this guy, at least from the spine standpoint, uh, very quickly. And here's what some of the intraoperative x-rays look like, combined to uh, uh, confirming the trajectories of the plan, and here's what he looks like postoperatively. Uh, he's in a brace, and I didn't even brace him for very long because he had such robust internal fixation. Here's a guy who's paraplegic from a T10 extension uh, distraction injury, again, multiple orthopedic injuries, and we don't want to be doing a six or eight hour open case on this guy. We need to stabilize him, fix him, uh, and get him going. Here's what the uh, robotic plan looks like. Here's what the postoperative CT looks like. Uh, is he got a perfect reduction? No, uh, but he's paraplegic, and this should suffice for an, uh, an appropriate uh, result. Here's uh, some deformity, which I don't do a ton of, so I borrowed this from Dr. Martin Pham from UC San Diego. So this is a revision surgery from someone who had a thoracolumbar fusion and is developing kyphosis. And this is, you can see a combined open exposure, but robotics. So the open big wax surgeons can certainly uh, have this uh, ability to adopt the technology. And you can see the very, very high correlation of the plan on the software with the intraoperative x-rays. And so you can see we can even do, uh, Dr. Pham does a lot of robust deformity and revision surgeries, but can get really, really nice spinal deformity results uh, using these enabling type technologies. So in conclusion, you know, we can use these technologies to achieve, you know, things that are great, like outpatient lumbar fusions. Uh, we can still do the best operation we can and make it better. And so every five to 10 years, I think there's significant spine technology that you should consider looking at. Uh, and if you're ever interested in coming down to Tucson, there's my email address. You can give me a call or a text. Happy to host you down in Tucson. Uh, so again, three issues. Please remember to consider enabling technologies as part of your training or your early career. Number two, look at every patient in a way that you can do a better operation for your next patient. And number three, consider lifelong learning so that uh, you don't become an old fuddy-duddy and you're still a, a very highly technical surgeon at the middle or end of your career, even better than you are at the beginning of your career. Great, thanks. Any, any questions for Dr. Chua? Yes, Dr. Skaggs, go ahead. Okay, I guess the mic's, ah, the mic's working, yay. Hey, I love your enthusiasm. Uh, I, too, now love using robots for very select things like spondies, you know, just slow me up for a big case. Um, the question is, I've now seen a few presentations where people talk about 99% accuracy. This is awesome. But when you dig down deeper, sometimes the 1% that wasn't good was a burr going into the spinal cord and paralyzing someone. And I've seen a couple of cases where if you're using a robot that has only one reference frame and somebody hits that by a centimeter, then every other screw is a centimeter off. I've seen you know, seven cases now where 
pedicle screws are being put in the canal. So I guess I'd caution everyone in the audience to you know, take this with a grain of salt. It's not just all butterflies and rainbows. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true, and I, I certainly don't want to uh, give you the impression that technology, great technology, makes up for a bad surgeon, right? So I think technology can help average surgeons be above average. It can have, maybe help average surgeons become super surgeons. It's not going to take a bad surgeon to make you average. So you still have to know how to use the technology. You still have to know how to troubleshoot potential issues like skiving or like uh, misrepresentations or misplacements. And and I, I I know there's a lot of Medtronic stuff here, but so I'm not here to propose a specific robot. Every robot, every technology, every navigation, every implant has got its potential issues. You just need to be aware of those as as you're using them in your learning curve and then make it a, a great part of your practice. And one thing I think that people in training and old farts like me specifically have to remember about a robot is you tend to lose proprioception. And you somehow you know, lose all the years of experience and next thing you know, you're just going right into the canal by accident. True. And then I'll just leave you with one final, one final analogy. How many of you would try to get back to your hotel tonight by memory and not using your nav on your phone or your, ho or your car, right? So there are technologies that you have to learn how to use appropriately to fit, um, fit the use. I don't want to get lost in downtown Seattle, so I'll use my nav. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I love your talk on navigation. I still don't understand the robotic part. Because all I see is navigation. Uh, it's a major difference between the, the general surgical robotic that can suture tissues and replace the fine tuned surgical skills in cases that are different. Right now, we have a system that guides the pedicle screws. Uh, many, 99%, you may say, oh, helps to do my teeth fell, but it's basically pedicle screws guidance. That is the robot part that holds your hand is that your hand is the drill guide. Yeah, no. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I think the idea, and I had the same idea and, and preconceived notion even when I started robotics. But like anything else, the more you use it, the more you find how it can be impactful for other parts of the operation. So planning the correction, planning the inner body cage. Soon we'll be able to plan and actually do the decompression with the robot. It's not the same as Da Vinci, so, so that is absolutely true. Um, but I think, for instance, half of this room doesn't use navigation on a routine basis. Systems now that you can get, you will have navigation and robotics all in one system. This particular system had navigation embedded into the robot, and the robot is fully functional without navigation. And the thing that is hard to measure is the efficiency and standardization of putting in the pedicle screws. I can put in a pedicle screw now with a robot with two steps, drill and put the screw in. And so that's a combination of planning, navigation, and a robot. So if you have two surgeons operating, you can gain some efficiencies, especially with a multi-level operation with robotics. So you are telling me that if I use only navigation, I don't have the planning? That's the difference? So uh, well, you, you, ask for, you ask for some. That's one of the differences uh, with robotic. That's, some of, that's one difference between robotics and navigation is the ability to plan. Oh, I understand. Uh, my point is that robotic is a marketing tool, uh, and and navigation is the real thing. Is it going or not? Well, well, one thing about the I think the robotics, Linda. as far Can as you navigation check if it's is going? concerned, is that yes, it is. It, robotics is a type of navigation, but uh, I feel also that it's an efficient navigation. Yeah. Because when you're navigating, you're looking at the screen, trying to figure out the trajectory, looking at it, and you waste a little bit of time. With a robot, you just the, the trajectory is predetermined, and you don't waste that fiddling time. And, and I would, for the young surgeons, you can and should market yourself based on your reputation and your patient success. 
But let's not forget, you're gonna work for a group, you might work for a hospital system, and you should consider contributing to the marketing of your services, right? So when you get out in practice, no one knows who you are, no one. Right, But if you can use a hospital system to leverage the marketing of you and your group against the other hospital and hospital systems and the other groups, that's a win. So more patients come into your clinic includes more patients you do operations, includes a better successful program.